and from the corporate fashion leaders and with you who are also all leaders here today. I hope this process and the discussion will help to develop our leadership abilities here in Jamaica. And not simply for us to focus on the checks or the matters arising from the previous or the correction of spelling errors in the middle. That we and that we we should not just focus on what we're taught in our school systems, which is to perform perfunctory tasks, but instead to have a serious look at, at our purpose and what we can achieve that. Way. So, with that said, I welcome General McChrystal. Retired four star general Stan McChrystal is the former head of U.S. and international forces in Afghanistan and the former leader of Joint Special Operations Command, JSOC. Called one of America's greatest warriors by Secretary of Defense Robert Gates, he led the military's most sensitive forces and created a revolution in warfare that fused intelligence and operations. Among his many accomplishments, his leadership is credited with the December 2003 capture of Saddam Hussein and the June 2006 location and killing of Abu Musab al zarqawi the leader of al-Qaeda in Iraq. McChrystal now shares his proven leadership insights off the battlefield. He co-founded the McChrystal Group, which delivers innovative leadership solutions to organizations in order to help them transform and succeed in challenging and dynamic business environments. Stan is also a senior fellow at Yale's Jackson Institute for Global Affairs, where he teaches a graduate seminar on leadership and operation. An advocate for service at all levels, McChrystal is the chair of Service Year Alliance, a project of Be the Change and the Aspen Institute which envisions a future in which a service here is a cultural expectation and common opportunity for every young American. He is active on several boards of directors, including JetBlue Airways and Fiscal Note, and he is also the author of the best-selling books, My Share of the Task, a memoir, Team of Teams, which explores how organizations can break down silos and work together more effectively in the modern business environment, and his newest book, Leaders, Myth, and Reality, do out this fall. Dynamic, innovative, and relentless in the pursuit of results. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Stan McChrystal. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you've ever had to watch a video about yourself. They, they ought to play this at my funeral and they say to you, but this is a humbling opportunity for Andy and I to be here. One, to, to join you, and two, to speak to you about something that many people in the room know more and practice more leadership than I will ever know. So I am truly thankful for the opportunity to interact with you, and I'll see if we can't push the conversation forward a little bit. One of the things Mr. Jarrett told me was, if you're going to be effective, you've got to start off by impressing the audience. <laughs> So here I am. <laughs> I can see that didn't work. Let me try this. I went to West Point. You look at West Point, you go, wow. That actually looks pretty cool. And here's the dirty secret. It only looked that way two days a year. And I was accepted in the summer of 1972. And the American military was not very popular then. And so, statistically speaking, it was the easiest year in the Academy's 200-year history to be admitted. <laughs> so, so here I am. <laughs> but still, I had a great opportunity. I went to the military. I had a number of experiences that were just extraordinary. And you know, the danger of success, the danger of getting in a room like this, is at some point, you start thinking that maybe I am pretty good. Or they wouldn't invite me to things like this. Or I wouldn't get these opportunities. And there's the danger that you start to let your self-esteem grow a little bit more than you should. Of course, that happens to everybody. I retired, and about a year ago, something happened that made my problem even worse. At West Point, there's a hotel called the Hotel Fayette. It's all a historic place. 
people go there when there's graduation week, during football weekends, and parents stay there. And this historic hotel sitting right on the, the academy grounds, beautiful place, makes the decision to dedicate a room in the hotel to me. Now I've never had anything in my life dedicated to me. And suddenly I have a room in a hotel dedicated to me. And what's worse, they put up a brass plaque. And this plaque is there, and it's talking about my career. And so suddenly, not only am I great because I've got a hotel room, I'm immortal. <laughs> because that's what a bronze plaque equals. So I am great and immortal, and I'm feeling really good about myself. And he's not so sure. <laughs> but still, about six months ago, we got the opportunity to go up to Westport to go to a wedding. Two young people that we knew would get married. They were going to get married right at the hotel fair. So I told Andy, we're going to the wedding, and we're staying at the hotel fair, and we're going to stay in the Stan McChrystal room. And she goes, well, I don't know about that. I said, we are. She goes, it may be expensive. I don't care. So she calls up there and I get her afterward. I said, did you get it? She says, I did. It is expensive. I said, it doesn't matter. She goes, we didn't even get a discount. <laughs> I said, not the matter. This is an important thing. So we go up to West Point. We check into the hotel. We go into the thing. We go down this hallway and there's the bronze plaque at the end of the hallway. Then the door to the room off to the left. You know, I go to that thing, I bow slightly and hurt the back to myself. We go in the room, and there are all these pictures around the room of around my, of periods of my life. And I thought, how cool is this? So I got in the room, and I just sort of stood there and inhaled the standness of it all, you know? <laughs> and Annie's shaking her head, and then she sees a little coffee table, and on the coffee table, there's a guest book. And so she says, I wonder what people write in the guest book in the standing room. And then she starts, and you can see Andy, she's got kind of a cynical view, not, never takes me quite as seriously as I take myself. And in this guest book, this is what she finds. <laughs> this girl... Product of that education. <laughs> this girl doesn't know that I'm great or that I'm immortal. She doesn't even know I exist. But you know, it's a good reality check. Because sometimes the 16 year old girl will bring you right back down to earth. And sometimes that's where we need to be. Because the reality is we're in a pretty complex time. And we got to face the current reality. It's in front of us. Think about our world. Think about the world you were born into. Think about the world we were educated in. Think about the world in which we live. And this is a part of the world where I spent a good part of my life. Afghanistan. Seems a long way away. But then when you're there, everywhere seems like that's where you ought to be at the time. When I came to take command in the summer of 2009, Afghanistan was broken up into five divisional areas. There were 46 nations fighting in a coalition to help the Afghan people protect their sovereignty. So we had five nations commanding division-sized areas, and within that, the military forces of 46 different nations all put together in a broad coalition. If you looked at the threat assessment, what you could see is the darker areas, the red, show where there's a greater enemy threat, greater presence of Taliban and Al-Qaeda. But when you look hard at the country, it's not one place. It's a bunch of different places. There's a local reality, not only to every province and every one of the 364 districts, but literally to every valley. The nature of the society and the tribal nature of it is such that things can be completely different one valley over. And what 
people had to deal with military forces as they came was really thought provoking. Because if you see the reality of the world we're in, we had this requirement to act locally, to understand that there's a, a nuanced reality. But at the same time, we need to think globally. For us, we found there were four major requirements. We had to align the strategy. We had to create what we call shared consciousness. That's a common understanding of what is happening, the reality of the situation on the ground. We had to leverage a network. And that network was far more complex than people might realize. I mentioned the 46 nations. That doesn't count the Afghans or the nations in the region, or the 1,700 national or uh, non-governmental organizations operating inside Afghanistan. And then we had to learn to lead like a gardener. We had to learn in a way different from what we had grown up before. And that really is around the idea of creating an environment or an ecosystem in which the people that work for you, with you, and you ultimately work for are empowered and best positioned to succeed. Talk about aligning the strategy. The strategy in Afghanistan really was built about several requirements at once. Partner with the Afghan National Security Forces, prioritize governance, a challenge, particularly in Afghanistan, but almost everywhere. Gain the initiative on the ground, and the initiative wasn't just military, the initiative was economically. It was in the minds of the people. <coughs> and then focus resources, because for all the talk about how much money's been spent in forces there, there's never enough. There's always a requirement to prioritize what we do and focus so we get best effect. We had to create what we call shared consciousness. When I arrived, there was the reality that we were fighting at least five separate wars in each of the five traditional areas. And what we did was to create this connection across the command, we created a daily interaction. And that daily interaction was a bit akin to a staff meeting. But now with information technology, and because we are dispersed, geographically dispersed, across not only Afghanistan, but all the places that support the effort in Afghanistan, what we had to do was connect more people. When I started, we had about 30 minutes a day where we got about 50 people in the room and we communicated what was happening. And then the idea is that would cascade down to different levels of the chain of command and the information would get out and then obviously information would come up the chain of command in the same way. The problem with that is in a fast-moving environment, we have six levels in our chain of command. So if the first meeting's at 9 in the morning, the next meeting's at 10, then at 11, by the time you get down to the people actually doing the work, they don't have time to participate in this. They certainly don't have time to pass information back up. And so suddenly we found in a world where you have to have daily synchronization to focus the organization and the effort, you just don't have the opportunity to do it fast enough, even leveraging information technology. And yet we had this sacred thing in the military, the chain of command that you never want to violate. You never want to talk to your subordinate subordinate because that's violating it. Then we realized we had to throw out the rule books because we would lose if we did not. And we did. And what we did was we connected everybody. We had the technology to do it. We connected the entire force. And we went from a 30-minute meeting with about 50 people to a 90-minute meeting with 7,500 people, all connected. And I know some of you who don't like meetings are starting to shake. And you're saying, that's horrifying. That's the mother of all meetings. I will tell you it's the most efficient thing I've ever been a part of. Because what happened in one 90 minutes, everybody understood what the situation was, what the context of what we were trying to do was. And then we didn't make decisions and give instructions. We didn't have to. Information which used to reside only at the top of the organization be limited to the C-suite 
where the key leaders now were shared across the organization and people they were empowered, not just empowered, they were expected to take action on that. It liberated the organization from a thousand ugly meetings. We had to leverage our network. And you think about a network, this is the patch or symbol of the International Security Force in Afghanistan. And you think of it as a command. This is how we do business. This is what I commanded. But the reality is, when you get up close, that's not at all the reality of it. First there's the Afghan government. And this is only a depiction of part of it. There's the American government. There are the 46 nations of the coalition. There's NATO. There's the rest of the United States effort, the intelligence community, all this. Suddenly we realize that, and the non-government organization, we realize that I'm a military commander and many of the people that I have to leverage and be effective with aren't my command. I can't hire them, I can't fire them, I can't order them, but I can't succeed without them. And the key was convincing them they couldn't could succeed without us. The key was in understanding that nobody, particularly the Afghan people, could get a good outcome unless we all got a good outcome. And yet we're raised with sort of the idea of give me a mission in my narrow lane, grade me on what I do. And the reality is we're only graded or we should be graded on whether we accomplish that which we have to accomplish for any test. It can apply to a lot of places. You think of all the things any organization has to do, all the connections you have to have, all the things that have to come together to be effective. It's almost never a clean organizational chart. It's a set of relationships based upon trust, based upon compromise, based upon interaction. And then the idea that we've got to lead in a different way. I grew up as a military commander. My father was a soldier. My father's father was a soldier. My four brothers were soldiers. My sister married a career soldier. Annie's father was a career soldier. Her three brothers are soldiers. Her sisters, you got it, right? <laughs> when I thought of leadership, I thought you had to be in uniform. It was better if you had a horse. <laughs> and that leaders had to act like admirals on the sea or generals on the battlefield. And what did that mean? That means you had to have the answer to all the questions. You have to be there and be able to give solid direction. And it's a chain of command based upon your brilliance and your courage. And of course that's not true. No matter how brilliant and courageous you are, you're not enough in a big, fast-moving environment. What I found is the key to my effectiveness was in interacting with people. I got to Afghanistan thinking that I would lean over maps and I would move forces around, and my training in strategy and tactics and warfare were going to make me effective, and that was almost irrelevant. Any effectiveness I was going to have was going to be through other people. And most of that would be through people who didn't wear uniform. And people that only cooperated with me if they chose to. In many cases, they walked in the room saying, I'm not going to cooperate with them because they're military. And so the requirement to break down those walls, the requirement to create a sense of trust, a sense of shared purpose, was what I found my major task was. And since I've retired, I found that time and again. Now, how do you do it? First, you've got to figure out what it is everybody wants. You've got to be move fast, but think. Listen. Be empathetic. Understand what it is we're really trying to do, all of us, not just what I want, 
but what they want. Because we're not going to get just what any one person wants. We're going to get what we all collectively decide we will commit to. And to a degree, as the four star in Afghanistan, I do this physically, but I also do it symbolically as well. I mean, I can listen to people, but I'm one person, but the reality is pictures of me listening or stories of me listening hopefully are contagious to other people so that becomes part of the behavior of the organization. And that's true, the more senior we get, we start to be symbolic. And that's got great power and responsibility. I am the first general to put a Bob Marley quote. But <laughs> 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 he could have been written for this. Think about it. It's all about people. I, the question I get most often is, what's different between military leadership and, and leadership in the civilian world? The answer is nothing. And people say, well, what it is, it's life and death in the military. It's life and death everywhere. It's people's lives, it's their health care, it's their welfare, it's their hopes and dreams. That's what people respond to and for. Now, if we're going to change in a changing environment, and we are or we will fail, how do you do that? It's easy for me to say, okay, we've got to change. They get off the stage and everybody goes, well, what do we do? Well, you've got to start by inspiring people for the need for change and the will to make that change. The way I was taught you start, you have to try to be inspirational. So when I got to my command and I knew we were going to do significant change in direction, I did what I was taught. You put on your most charismatic uniform, you get out in front of people, you use words that you hope will inspire. You've heard me for a few minutes, you know how they responded, right? <laughs> okay, that's a bit of an exaggeration. <laughs> Actually, from where I was, it looked a bit different. It looked like this. As I got in front of the organization and said, we're going to make major changes, they were literally locked shields with spears out and says, no way. Because people are comfortable in what they are, what they do, and how they do it. It's not because they're evil. And I started to get things back. I started to get feedback. Some of it may be familiar. For us it is, things are working so far. Why change? And my response is, things aren't working so far. We're losing. We have to change. But if people see it from just their vantage point, they may go, well, it's pretty good here. So sometimes you have to show them the big picture and go, we are actually in great trouble. We all have to change, not just those people over there. The second is around risk. What if it doesn't work? There's a truism in the military. If the enemy shoots artillery or mortar fire and they hit your position, you should move. <laughs> I know that seems I know that seems self evident. <laughs> but what happens invariably is rounds start coming in and someone says we should move it and somebody else goes, Well, what direction should we go? We need to figure that out. Hey, it doesn't matter. Everywhere is better than here. <laughs> and you know sometimes that's true with change. When I got in command and we were failing it was pretty simple that we had to change. I had no idea how we had to change or what we had to be. Didn't have that vision, didn't possess it. But what I did have is data on one course of action, what we were doing. So that one course of action had been proven ineffective. So that's the one thing we were not going to do. And so what I communicated was, okay, we're gonna do something different from what we're doing now. Now what we're going to do, I don't know. And I did the leader big hand wave. I said, we're going to do this. We're going to go out there and do different. We're going to do whatever it takes to be successful. And it was interesting. It turned out to be very, very valuable not to have that vision. 
Because in my command, if I had this detailed plan and I put it in front of people, I had a bunch of cynical naysayers. They would have leaned back and they would have nitpicked and found problems with it and poked holes in the plan. And they'd probably been right. But who can disagree with a plan that says, we're going to do whatever it takes to win? And you're going to figure it out. And I said, whatever we start to do, if it works, we'll do more of it. If it doesn't work, we'll stop it. And we'll iterate until we get it right, and you will figure it out as a group. It turned out to be extraordinarily fortuitous, because it took much of the responsibility for me and put it on us. I just get responsible as a leader. But the reality is it put it on us to figure out our way ahead and to navigate it. This next one I never once heard. It says, will there be room for me in the new system? And you, you see that and say, well, that's being selfish or disloyal. No, it's not. It's being human. Everybody thinks about themselves. Everyone. All of us do. And you have to understand we're leaving people. And then the final one is pretty powerful, too. I'm too busy. Someone says, I want you to make a major change, then people go, what do you want me to stop doing while I do this? And it's a fair point. If we say you've got to do all of these things and also make a big change, it's unrealistic. They're either not going to make the big change, or they're not going to do all these, and it's better if you sort that out together before. Finding the part that's really sort of core to, to what the people in this room think about, and that's leading change. How do we actually do that? You know, you've heard me for a while and you said, well, you know, Stan had a problem and he's talking about change. But you may be thinking in your own mind, yeah, that's true, and, and a bunch of other people need to change, but I actually don't have to. I'm pretty successful. I got two smartphones, a computer, a great assistant, and I'm willing to work with kids. So I think I can keep doing what I'm doing and I'm going to be okay. You may be right. You can keep doing what you're doing and you'll probably have be successful. <laughs> Until you're not. And the reality is, you go, no, wait a minute. I've been doing this for years and it worked. It worked for my parents. It worked for my grandparents. And I'm as clever and hardworking as they were. The answer is things have changed. The environment's changed. We're in a complex, fascinating environment that's not like what anyone else has ever experienced before. We need to think differently about it. We talk about where we're trying to get to. And this is something I don't think we think enough about. We say we're at A, we've got to get to B. And the leader gets in the room, we've got to get here. Well, the reality is, in any organization I've ever been in, we never went straight from A to B. We always went kind of like this. Not because we didn't want to go straight, but because it's hard to go straight, hard to figure it out. And you sort things out as you go along. And getting from A to B is still important, but I'd argue there's something even more important. And that's understanding our boundaries. And our boundaries really should be around a defining vision of what we're about. What are our values? What do we care about? Because if we've got to go outside of those to get to the objective, I would argue we have lost the moment we've done that. We've lost as individuals, we've lost as organizations, we've lost our ways as society. But sometimes we don't spend enough time defining that for ourselves. We don't spend enough time saying, this is what we believe. I wrote a book called Leaders, Myth, and Reality, and the 13 leaders came out. And the one who came out as my biggest hero was Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. For several reasons. One, he's really of my era. I was a young man when Dr. King really began his movement. My family's from the South, but my mother was very interested in the Civil Rights Movement. So from a young age, I was intimately aware of what Dr. King was doing. I can remember his words 
in August 1963. Those words are known to people far outside his native United States. Those may be the most famous words spoken in the speech in the 20th century. But they weren't the words he intended to give. In fact, this was at the March for Jobs and Progress in August 1963 on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial in Washington, D.C. And what had happened is it had been planned for a long time. There were 16 speakers. He was the 11th speaker. He was the most famous person to speak. And so most people were there to hear him. 250,000 people convened around the Lincoln Memorial to hear Dr. Tim. He stayed up until 4 in the morning writing a speech to make the arguments, the points he wanted to make. He got up in front of the crowd. It was a warm afternoon, not brutally hot, but a warm afternoon with great excitement. And he started to speak. And for 11 minutes he spoke using his prepared remarks. And the people were polite, but they didn't really respond. And then from behind him, a lady that he knew, Mahalia Jackson, a gospel singer, said, Martin, tell him about the dream. He departed from his speech and went into a familiar riff we know now of I Have a Dream. And he changed the way we think through the next five minutes of his speech. And the next five minutes wasn't a man just projecting. It was an interaction between a man and the crowd. And now a man in history. But when we think about Dr. King, there's a temptation to think about Dr. King on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial giving an iconic speech. But to me, the thing that's so impressive about Dr. King is he joined the, the uh, Civil Rights Movement in 1955 as a 26-year-old brand new reverend in a church in Montgomery, Alabama. He took informal leadership of what was called the Montgomery Improvement Association and led the Montgomery bus boycott to desegregate transportation in Montgomery. For 382 days, he led this movement that ultimately succeeded. But it didn't. wasn't success in the entire civil rights movement. It was just one small piece in one southern city. And for the next 13 years, what Dr. King did was, he had this role that was far beyond being a spokesman or symbol. He was a steward. He was a network manager. He was an organizational head. He literally was a roll-up-your-sleeves manager and leader on a daily basis. Because the Civil Rights Movement wasn't a single organization in lockstep that moved forward. It was big personalities, multiple groups, all with different aims and objectives, bound together and constantly rebound together by Dr. King's energy and networking skills supported by some other great leaders. What Dr. King represented is, it wasn't a gift, he wasn't born to be a charismatic leader, he made the choice to do that. He gave 13 years of his life until his murder in 1968. And he did all of that and died before the age of 40. The most impressive thing about Dr. King is not what he did, because we know what he stood in front of, we know the role that he had in the Civil Rights Movement. But to me the most impressive thing is when he was gone, the movement continued on. And it's not over. It hasn't won. But Dr. King moved it along. We must keep moving. We must keep going. If you can't fly, run. If you can't run, walk. If you can't walk, crawl. But by all means, keep moving. 
Thank you very much, and I look forward to taking your questions.